Wow, that's a lot of mud. This is the, uh, <laughs> the I-95 for mice. That was a joint. That's actually a dead mouse in there. <laughs> Where the hell is that cut all the way through and then tacked together with this? So almost half of this house in the middle here is being carried by three nails on that side and three nails on this side. No joist hangers. Wow. Screw on. <laughs> Look at all this beautiful space. Very important to turn off your breakers. Listen, I mean, when you see a handyman special like this, don't assume they know how to do electrical if they don't know how to do anything else. But if you're not in the budget to reframe your whole house, then this is the way to go. Now we have a door. That's a big rodent. Renovator one, bathroom, nothing. Here's the secret weapon. Better to learn how to do this yourself. Look, look at the water damage here. This is where it gets interesting. Oh yeah. <laughs> that is crazy. Look at this. That is fantastic. This is not even four feet wide. Well, welcome to my old house. This is a project we picked up a couple years ago. It's kind of like a bit of a retirement plan almost before we started our YouTube channel. And now it's turned into just a gold mine of opportunity to share with folks what you can do if you want to buy an old beast like this and turn it around and fix it up, make everything brand new. And what's going to happen with your asset versus mortgage value and all that kind of business. So we got a real old pig here that needs a whole lot of love and a whole lot of lipstick. And so what we're going to do is we're going to go through all these different aspects of renovating. You can see we have a main body of the house plus this little addition, which is perfect because my wife and I are empty nesters now. So what we're going to do is we're going to fix up the loft as a bedroom. It has a bathroom in the front, but it needs to be completely overhauled. And we're going to move our front door from this location around the side. Two major reasons. It's noisy out here. There's a lot of road traffic and we have this huge open field and the wind in the winter time comes barreling through. And every time we open that door, I swear it cost me $100 in heat. So we're gonna redesign that whole main floor area and create a living space for us so that we can gut and then rebuild the entire home on camera for you guys. And we can go through this whole process together. We're talking all new wiring, new water systems. We're bringing in structural engineers. We've got trees in the basement of structure. Oh my God. There's no venting on any of the plumbing. Everything's a disaster. I don't think there's been an electrical or building inspector in this home in the entire history of his life. So we're gonna change all that and get everything back up to speed so that we have a big, beautiful house on this gorgeous acre property. Love living in Canada, because wherever you want to, you can get 10 minutes out of town and be in the country and have lots of space. So we're gonna transform the inside of the house and hopefully in the next couple of years, we'll be able to get outside the house and fix all this too, fencing, and a new pool, new deck, new shed. The list is endless. I'm glad I've got such a good fixer upper because it's gonna work out really well for the channel. <laughs> so, no more working on other people's homes for the next little while. I gotta get my own work done. Let's go on and take a look inside and see how bad this is. addition has been absolutely useless really. It's a second story loft and it has this great big space down here but everything's been chopped up in hallways and entranceways and you can see behind me this used to be a secondary door. Um, the way this is built it's extremely cold. They don't have the proper heating. They didn't frame it right. I mean there's a lot of do-it-yourself or mistakes in this project. So what we're doing is we're peeling this thing back, taking it back to the frame so we can understand what they did and how they did it so that we can turn this into a livable space. The goal here ultimately is to move the staircase to this location over here, get different access upstairs so that the stairs is in an area where they have windows and open this area up entirely so there's an actual front foyer to the home. <sighs> there's a lot to do. We've just got a little bit started. I understand now the basic gist behind their building technique. So far it's not looking too scary, but uh, you never know what we're gonna find. So one of the things we noticed when we started tearing everything apart is that there's a lot of different levels of flooring going on here. So we're not sure what the original space was used for, but this window here, it's single pane glass. 
That is not a thermal window. So I don't think they ever really designed this space to be a four season living area, but that's what we're gonna convert it to. And part of our job here is get rid of this window, close it all up. We're gonna put in our staircase here. The idea is to try to create a landing near the top where you can walk into the bedroom straight on because the ceiling does have a slope and it introduces the slope at about a five foot wall height. So if we take the stairs all the way to the outside corner, they're gonna be ducking around a corner. And that's the problem they have right now with the current stairs. When it comes down here, our goal is to have a nice landing, maybe a piece of offset glass to separate the, the entranceway from the staircase. Nice, big, open, easy to move your furniture around. There we go. Well, with the location of the staircase where it is right now, it forces the entrance to this room to be actually on the wind side of the property. And since it's out in the country, there's a ton of cold wind blowing through here in the wintertime. So the idea here is to be able to rip the stairs out get rid of that door and put a brand new front door right here. Now that's the original plan, but remember, when you're dealing with a project like this, the first goal is to peel it all back, find out what the scope of work is gonna be, then we can make our final decisions. Okay, so we've got our ceiling removed, we understand our structure, we know this isn't carrying any load, so what we wanna do is we wanna take off the wall, drywall first. The idea here is, the bigger the piece, the better. Oh, there was a joint right there on that stud. And having a big wrecking bar like this makes this so much easier because you don't have to fight too much with what's going on. I know there's no mechanical in here. And then jiggle, all right? Here's the goal. If you jiggle the drywall, the screws that are in the surface, the head of the screw will pop through the paper and the drywall loses all of its strength. And then you can just grab it, okay? And it usually comes off and pretty good pieces. Oh, here we go. This is another layer. This wall actually was originally outside corners. There didn't, there wasn't a door here originally. So somebody framed this door on here and didn't open that back up to the frame. put more screws in a small space than in a big one. So I know this is a hollow wall. So one of the secrets that I have for getting rid of drywall, just punch it through from the other side. There we go. That's another joint. Just a bit of a jiggle. That's how it works there. Wow, that's a lot of mud. You know, it was uh, pretty normal back in the day especially in the older homes. There used to be a different kind of culture. You know, you had your adult spaces and your kid spaces, walls and doors everywhere to kill the drafts. But look at this, all we did was take the drywall off. Look how much bigger the space is. There's nothing structural going on here. At the end of the day, this probably could have just been a half wall or a railing. But if you wanted to save some money, you could have just put a half wall in here. It would have made moving furniture and stuff up here a lot easier. Okay. Very important to turn off your breakers. Listen, I mean, when you see a handyman special like this, don't assume they know how to do electrical if they don't know how to do anything else. Now, I'm gonna wanna have some power on later, so if I can maintain the integrity of this box, then that would be fabulous. That way, in case they did some creative wiring and there's still power to this, at least you're working safe. With do-it-yourself renovations, you might think you've turned off the power, but. You don't really know. So unless you're turning off the power to the whole house, just play it safe. Because, man, they never know where they're gonna find a power lead somewhere in the basement and fish it all the way over to here and it's totally unrelated to this part of the house. Oh, okay, time to rip out a wall. Okay, so we're gonna rip out a stud wall now. The idea here, you wanna just check for two things. A, you're up against the stairs. So generally speaking, there's gonna be a few locations where they've nailed the side of the staircase into the wall. So just have a quick look. There's enough movement there. There's no nail in this particular stud. 
So I'll teach you how to take out a stud. This is made where there's two nails from the top plate and two nails from the bottom plate, and then they stand the wall in place. So the way to remove a stud, quick and simple, is actually take one of these bad boys from Stanley. This is my favorite wrecking bar. And this is just batter up, right? Hit right down near the bottom. You don't have to be crazy with your force, just enough that you're gonna be bending over the nails and knock the bottom loose. A couple of little shots like that, all right? And then you pull it towards you. You're pulling it off the ceiling now. You see the separation you have? And you give it a twist and a yank. It's that simple, always under control. Don't be wild and crazy. Again. got a couple of extra nails in it, a couple extra twists and you're good to go. So just because you see a lot of wood doesn't necessarily make it structural. I'm not sure why there's a double plate here. I think it's just the creative process that this person went through. They built the wall. Basically what you want to understand is this. The foundation of the house all the way around, that can carry all the weight of the whole house. And in most cases, depending on the width of your house, your floor joists will transfer from outside of the house to the other side of the house. All the weight that's on that, on that second level. If the span is so long that it needs to have a supporting wall, then that supporting wall weight will be transferred as a point load down to something else that's also structural. And that's not a floor joist. It's usually a steel beam or it's all the way down to the floor and the concrete in your basement. And they've poured a footing there. So if you look in your basement and take a look, if you have no steel, and your house is only 16 feet wide, chances are they're just going straight across and nothing on the main floor is structural. Uh, if there is a structural wall, of course, all of that can be removed and re-engineered. There is no limit to how much open space you can have. It really comes down to uh, getting a good engineer and opening up your wallet. Look at all this beautiful space. And the best part is, uh, it is exactly 16 feet wide, this structure. Because of this whole flooring system and this decking, this is not going to be as easy to come out. Now both of these studs stop at the plate, so I'm going to just hit the top of this in that direction until it gives up the ghost. Short swing. Remember, if I miss, you got to think, what's my follow through? There it goes. Mission accomplished. So now we're going to take out the stairs. Should be pretty straightforward. And I'm hoping to be able to reuse the stringers. Uh, I have the same rise and run going on where the new location is. We'll just do that. Oh, that is a lot of screw. <laughs> Here we go. Do not do this without eye protection. I've seen it a lot of times. These nails will come firing out real fast. All right, yeah, that's a good size now. Yeah, they didn't nail the other side because they put that, they put the frame in first and then slid this wood in. There we go. Now you're right here. Okay. Hey, look, that one was actually nailed in. It shouldn't be that easy. <laughs> Sometimes you just need some therapy. You just want to hit something really hard. Oh, that feels good. Who needs a gym? Ah! There's a little piece of wood gonna give me more trouble than the whole flight of stairs. Right? <laughs> you know, to give you an idea how old this house is, back when they built this, they had one pair of clothes they worked in and one pair of clothes for Sunday. <laughs> you can see you have a structure here. It is not doubled up. 
So the floor joists come all the way across and tie into this one, but this is not doubled up. These are just blocks. And this has probably only been put in here so that they can build the wall, that knee wall above it. So I would say that this is a little too weak, especially since it's only nails. We'll end up having to put another two by eight on there, get rid of this little nailing block, add some joist hanger, probably on each end. Oh yeah. So that two by eight is just sandwiched in between the two, picking up one, two, three, three other joists. So almost half of this house in the middle here is being carried by three nails on that side and three nails on this side. No joist hangers. Wow. All right, so this wire here is a, it's a copper wire. And this is put in, it's a 14-2, it says right there. And NMD insulated probably back in the 60s, maybe early 70s, but probably the 60s. And this is when the wiring was first done and then it was closed up. There's no evidence here of any lath and plaster. I can't tell exactly how old it is because back then they never put dates on it. Nowadays, the new wire is all stamped with the date that was manufactured. So an inspector can tell the difference between wire that just went in and wire that went in five years ago. <laughs> so be careful out there. This is my stiletto tool. It's a gift from my son, Matthew. He uh, spent a summer doing framing on new house construction. It's good for him. Learn how to work like a man. And uh, it's got a hammer. It's got magnets. It's got all kinds of different claws and jaws. So you can pry and pull nails or any situation you got to deal with. This thing is just awesome. It's solid titanium. Costs a bloody fortune, but man, is it ever handy. Everything's finally out of the way. We'll get set. Don't make me look bad. <laughs> All right, so that is now no longer attached up here. Never the same day twice in my life. Every day is a new day. Well, if you're looking for a career and it's not boring, I'll tell you, <laughs> this is something to consider. One, two, three, four, five. Five nails. <laughs> well, there we go. We're pretty much done opening up the space now. I think before we go any further, we're going to take a little break. And we'll clean this up. Very important, clean as you go. You don't want to let the garbage build up to the point where it just gets mentally wears you down to see so much debris in the room, right? All right, so we are currently at a position here now where we've removed the stairs and the interior walls and we know exactly what we're dealing with. So we've kind of, ex we know what our scope of work is. All right, we're going to pull off the rest of the drywall and expose all the rest of the studs. Probably guarantee we're going to be re-insulating. I think a good plan here because the space is so huge now would be to add some furring strip onto the studs and let's get these walls up to uh, R20 insulation value. So we want to go and add another two by two on these studs at least. We have a 16 by nine foyer now. So now the options are limitless, right? Design your way. Uh, we can build a nice front entrance, put in some wainscoting, probably have a bench here for kids and the little cubby holes and that sort of thing. Uh, now there's no limit. What was really once a small cramped space that was absolutely useless, now it's become an actual room in the house. This is awesome. Oh, I love tearing things apart. So if you're like me, you bought yourself a home that's way too old for its own good, and you're trying to restore it and bring it back to life and make it function in today's modern climate and modern construction techniques. And so I've got a 140 year old crawl space here, and it's only a couple of feet deep and it gets worse as it goes along. So today we're going to show you how to flash and bat. Now this is a little controversial, so I'm sure we're going to have a lot of opinions in the comments section. I uh, welcome all of that conversation because it's hard to get really good information online. So we're going to break this down into steps for you. Step one, of course, was to vacuum up all of them, the spiders. Wherever you got a damp, cold space where you're going to have rodents, you're going to have lots of bugs and you're going to get lots of spiders. So I'm not much of a spider fan, so I like to clean it all up. Step number two, I want to not have to work in the dirt. It's a little freaking me out. <laughs> so I'm going to put down some vapor barrier and open that up on the floor so that I can crawl around on it. And when I'm done, I'm going to tape all these joints together to create one continuous barrier. But for now, I'm just going to use this as something to stay out of the dirt. I'm 
Okay. Hey. Ah. <laughs> That's actually a dead mouse in there. <laughs> I love my job. <laughs> All right, so when you're using spray foam in your house, you got two options. You can call the spray foam company, and you can call them to come in here from, with their truck and bring their hoses down, and they can do your crawl space for you. That's going to cost you a couple thousand dollars. Or you can go to the store and you can get one of these kits. In my case, I needed two. They're about 300 and change, depending where you live, I'm sure. Um, so for me, it's a little over $600 to spray foam this whole crawl space. And it's a 20 by 30 space, so that's a pretty good deal. Now, uh, I think every company, every building store in North America should carry this product line. It seems to be the only one that's in a box. This is a closed cell, not an open cell. So for those of you who care to research the difference between that, I'll let you do that on your own time. Um, I like the closed cell, I think it's a superior product, but you do have to be careful, of course. Hmm, yeah, read the instructions. Those aren't instructions, by the way. That's just a notice telling you to read them. Here we go, instructions. This is a book. Don't eat it, don't drink it, don't be dumb. It means you're dealing with some dangerous stuff, kids. Let's make sure that we use all of our safety gear here. There is a time and a place to be careful, and this is definitely the place. We're gonna need one of these. They give you a whole bag of these things. These are not syringes, these are just expansion foam spray nozzles. You can replace it, so a system like this, you can use, you can close it up, you can take off the nozzle, throw it in the garbage, you can store it in the cool, dry place, follow the instructions, and you can use it another day in another place. So you can also buy bags of these nozzles as well. So you can get good bang for your buck and have one of these handy. We're gonna put on the gloves, because we're gonna get right to this. So you know, the handle has a closed position and an open position. It's kind of like a safety, okay? That stops the flow of foam up to this point, and then you can change your tips every time you turn it off. This stuff sets up really quickly, so you don't want to leave it for 10 or 15 minutes with the gun in the open position and not using it. It will dry right there. Then you're done and this whole kit is garbage. All right? The kit here. Oh, yo, yo. Yeah, it is counterclockwise when you can get to it. <clears throat> open cylinder valve, no more than three turns. If you are a He-Man, half, one, half, two, half, three, Ugh. half, one, half, two, half, three. You can see when I spray foam the area that was done last week that it'll fill up all those gaps real easy. This is definitely a two stage process. If you need to do three, you need to do three. Some of this area here I might have to do more. Now I'm done for now where I'm sitting, I'm gonna close the gun off. Okay, and then I can reposition. This is a painstaking process. It's all the work is getting in the right position. Once you're here, the job itself is pretty simple. I'm just making sure my rim joists are coated properly. All right, now we're gonna do the second coat here. Emphasizing closing up all the gaps. Remember the directions said not to spray more than two inches at any one time. This is why this is a multiple coat application because there are gonna be places here that are more than two inches just because of the nature of the stone and the way the application goes. Now the amazing thing is when you're this close to the foam you really feel the heat pouring off. That's why they suggest you don't have it too thick when you put it on. I can't emphasize this enough, read your instructions. You can feel how warm this is. It's like sitting next to an electric baseboard heater. So we're going to get out of here, we're going to let this cure for about 10 minutes, and then we're going to come back and we'll put on the bat insulation. <laughs> so when you're working in the crawl space, if you're working in a situation like I am with stacked stone, or anywhere else where you've got a gap that you have to fill, 
One of the ways you can do that is by using this rigid insulation. All right, now that's not to do the insulating, that's to create a backer so that when I'm spray foaming, I can have something that holds the insulation spray foam, and that way I can con be consistent with my one and a half inch depth. You can see that that holds the foam really well. There we go. So we're gonna install our bat insulation now. Now this is an insulation blanket. So it comes with the insulations already kind of adhered to the backside of a vapor barrier. This is a three foot by 50 foot roll. Uh, local building store in my area also carried a four foot, which is good because our minimum code here is four feet from the frost line. All right, so obviously in unraveling this in the, in the crawl space would be insane. It's way too much product. So we're gonna open this up. We'll cut down a piece that's manageable and then we'll go into the hole and install it. Gonna be a little awkward to work with. I've cut it down, but even with that, there's a lot of product to fuss around with. My hole isn't exactly three feet tall everywhere yet. So, what I'm gonna do is try to lay this into position. do here this metal strap that comes on it is traditionally used for basement installation we want to just cut that out of the way so that we can lift this insulation up and over our wall into our rim joist cavity onto our plate here's our example okay so here's our example here so now I have my three foot blanket up against the wall, up and over top of my rim plate. Now this is really what I wanted to show you, was this blanket wrap comes down here and it has this plastic extension. If you install this on your wall in a basement, this is designed to cover the rim joist insulation, but in a crawl space, what you wanna do is tape this to the plastic vapor barrier you have on your floor to create a continuous vapor barrier. Okay, wow, it's really heating up in there. That spray foam while it's curing <laughs> and all this insulation is really warm. That's encouraging. <laughs> so on this video, we demonstrated, I guess we did about 15 linear feet, okay? And it took us about 15 minutes. So you get an idea of how quick this project can move along and how much time and material you're gonna have to invest in it. Definitely worth it. Cause once we're done in here, the space down here, all we need is one supply of heat run for every 300 square feet of crawl space, about a five inch pipe. And this will be just as comfortable as it is up in the living space. Well, now our crawl space is all insulated and sealed up. Well, what started out as a simple demolition ended up to be this massive reveal. We've got layer upon layer upon layer upon layer. Uh, we had four different kinds of flooring we had to pull out of this house. I think the house is almost three or four inches taller now. <laughs> it's just amazing. As far as I can tell, I think there's still a couple of areas where it ties into the house that are a bit of a concern, but my hole's in the wrong spot here and I was getting a little claustrophobic and kind of antsy to move forward. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna open a hole in the other side of the, the crawl space in the other corner where there's not very much access so we can finish all of that hard to reach space from above the floor. That way we can close this up and get moving on the project right away. Well, welcome back to our 1880s edition remodeling. We are stripping this bad boy back to find out what the hell they did when they built it 
and to be able to move forward with some sense of modern construction technology. God help us. The only thing that we've got here that I know is going to be good are the joists themselves. Although they are 24 inch on center, uh, they are very, very hefty. And because everything is done tongue and groove back in those days, uh, usually on top and underneath, there's lots of structure, but they've been repealing things back and peeling things back and changing structure. And it makes you a little nervous, you know? So we're gonna do a little exploration today and find out what we need to do so that I can sleep at night. <laughs> knowing that no one's ever going to have this collapse on them. Um, one of the things I can point out before we get moving on our tour is the electrical. Ho ho ho, Spaghettiville. Uh, here we are. We uncovered all of these junction boxes in the ceiling. We have wire from the 40s and the 60s and the 80s. And everybody's come in here and trap doors so that they could reach down and run their wiring. It's an absolute screw up. Uh, nothing here was ever up to code. There was ever no attempt to do anything safe. It kind of makes you think like, what the hell are we doing in here with the hydro even on? <laughs> anyway, we're gonna just go by the old adage that it's been here since 1880 and it's probably not gonna burn down tonight. So everything we do from here on in is to try to make it safer before we start closing things up. So what we have here is a exterior wall and it's a paper-backed wrapped insulation and there's nothing wrong with that. Um, the weird thing is, is that two of the walls here have the paperback insulation, and the other one is more of a, a really old-fashioned rigid fiberglass insulation. So I'm, without the paper, I'm not sure what came first, chicken or the egg here, but it's a little strange. Uh, right away, the structure, you know, take notice here. I mean, this is all coming down. This is a really thick plastic. It's actually probably is probably a super six quality. So I'm thinking the last time the renovations were done here must have been in the late seventies. I know they had this thick plastic back then. Uh, I'm not sure why whoever put this up stopped here. Cause when we pulled the drywall off, the drywall went right up to the floor. And so why you would stop your vapor barrier here and not continue it up into the joist cavity, I have no idea. But that's just one of those signs that says whoever did this, a didn't care b was selling the house or c was just that stupid i'm not sure which um you can see up here this is kind of fun this is the uh <laughs> the i-95 for mice one two three four five six holes really excited to pull all that old insulation out and have a look at what's going on behind there there is a fire stop in this wall which is amazing Right? I mean, this gives you a little bit of a structural rigidity. Oh yeah. There's all kinds of dirt in here. Woo! Loving it. So before we go and pull the rest of this down, man, there's a sandbox in the bottom of that plate. Before we pull the rest of that down, we'll have to mask up. But for the purpose of demonstrating what we're doing here today, I'm gonna take my life into my own hands and breathe some dirt. Here we go. Now, I have five nails nailing this floor joist into a balloon frame two by four. I'm just asking myself the question, is there any living chance in hell that that's gonna be acceptable? That means there's no point load. Everything here is just sitting on nails. Um, generally speaking, the shear strength on a nail is so strong that that is actually overkill. Uh, you'll see that in the old days, the cladding on the walls, they used to have it on the inside as well. And that cladding was part of the structure. When you see that, you'll find that there's only two nails in the board because it was all resting on the, on the interior cladding. But this, if it holds up like this, I'm actually pretty happy with it. There's no sense to do any additional blocking. I think I'm going to just grab some, uh, some structural screws that are designed to carry a lot of weight. Just throw in each joist just for good measure so I can sleep at night. All right, so I just wanted to point out a really interesting wiring technique here. Let's pull this out of the way. You can see what we have here is a 14-2 insulated wire <laughs> and a fancy dandy roofing nail. The idea here is uh, they notched out the front of every one of these studs, <clears throat> set a wire in there, and then use nails to hold it all in place. 
<laughs> I mean, kudos for the effort. I really appreciate the thought of making sure the wire didn't get fall out of the, 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 the little notch there so it wouldn't get pinched by the drywall. But, <clears throat> dear God, what in the hell are you thinking? All you had to do was drill a hole. Folks, if you're renovating your house and you don't have the technology available to drill a hole, don't do your own wiring, please. Please. Ay, ay, ay. Looks like all of the electrical in this entire edition is going to have to be ripped out and redone again. There's nothing in here that's salvageable. <clears throat> so we are remodeling an existing huge space that had no function at all in this house. This is a really ancient 1880 home, which in our country is pretty ancient, but depending where you live, you might find that rather new. Um, we've got some pretty solid construction here, but we're moving a staircase over to this area. We're going to lose the window and just make this space functions a little bit better. What we got to do is transfer our line from this wall upstairs so we can cut the floor and then we can reframe a new box so that this becomes a, a stairwell. <clears throat> really all in all it's not that tricky of a process. We're gonna have to just cut a couple of floor joists, throw in some new structural cross points here and then um, we'll just build the stairs in the space that we have provided. So the C system here is real simple. Make sure your wall is level and then find the point directly above the plate of that wall where the floor is, drill a couple holes. He's going to put a 2 by 4 on the floor up there, screw it down, run the saw down that. And then before you know it, we're going to have a great big hole here. And then we will build a couple of platforms and start throwing in some stairs. Hoorah! Hey Matt, you're not standing there, right? Anywhere near where I'm cutting a hole? Thank you. <laughs> Perfect. So right now, Matthew, my son, is upstairs with a 2x4, and he's just drawing a marker line on the floor from the edge of that hole to the edge of that hole. And then he's going to plunge his saw in there, and then we're going to rip open most of that floor. Should be a lot of fun to watch. Generally, tongue groove is uh, nailed through the, the tongue. Holy cow. That's not a whole lot of strength in that. Can you grab those? Let's just, just remove them up instead of down. That is awesome. There we go. Nice, simple removal. Getting more dirt in my face here. <laughs> That was a joint. <laughs> so the next step in creating our stairwell is to get rid of this. Is it kind of in the way? <laughs> um, basically, we're gonna need some temporary structural support. We're cleared up the area. No one's allowed up there until we're done restructuring. So all that's left up there is really the weight of the beam itself. Most of this flooring ties all the way across from outside to the next choice. There's another one of those dead bugs falling on me. So what we want to do, we just cut this 2 by 4 The floor underneath of us is structured almost identical to the one above. So I know that it's solid wood in both of these situations. Now, this is just temporary. You don't need any fasteners for this. Life is actually kind of simple here. So what I'm going to show you here is a, a technique for cutting a floor joist with the skill saw. And the way we do this, we just hold our little triangle up against the wood, and that'll be my straight line. And that removes all the dangers of cutting the nails because I can line up, and then all I gotta do is turn on again. Ah, here we go.
Now, now that we got that out of the way, we can trim, trim this all up with a reciprocator and get a little bit more exact. And, uh, you know, we're not gonna have a massive piece of wood to contend with, so now it's a one-man job. All right, so we got an update for our staircase. Um, turns out I was a little bit uh, zealous in my expectation to be able to make this staircase work. Not a big deal. What I'm gonna do is I'm gonna do a trip to the store, I'm gonna buy us a little bit more material, and we are gonna do a double curved staircase in this space, almost like a spiral staircase going upstairs. It's gonna be awesome. Um, so we're just gonna come back, and once we got our materials, we're gonna assemble it all, and then we'll do a quick time lapse to show you the whole building process. Uh, you're gonna be able to enjoy this a lot. Welcome back to my 1880s farmhouse renovation project. Dear Lord, we are biting off a big chunk here. Uh, last time we had you in the house, we were showing you, we were doing some demolition and we're looking at rebuilding our stairs. And of course, it's typical when you're in this kind of situation, uh, the plan changed. So we are redesigning our whole approach to this part of the room. We're changing our staircase. It's going to be a, uh, a staircase that has two different landings with the turns on it just to fit it into a tighter corner. We don't want to lose the access to the, from the door and move it just quite yet because that involves a whole lot of exterior work. So we're going to modify the staircase so that we can have it in a tighter space and keep the entrance way the way it is for now. And then we'll get to this one another video another day. We've got a big cedar hedge. My propane tanks are out here. There's just too much going on. And I got to be able to finish something before I move to the next project. So we are going to frame the inside of the wall so that when it's time to put in that new door, all the structural work is done in advance. And that is a great tip. Now, I just wanted to give you an idea of what I'm dealing with because it's a little bizarre. This is the original exterior of the original part of the house and we're in the addition. <laughs> the addition was also done probably early 1900s, okay? Just by the look of the layout, this is still balloon construction. It's 24 inch on center. It's a little ridiculous. It's one and a half inch soft wood lumber, tongue and groove floors. So they didn't have a change in the design style or the construction technique. But you can see that the way that renovations have been done in this home since it was built was very much to um, just leave everything intact and build onto it. And you see this all the time. So there's my exterior wall. I've got interior framing on this side of the wall. On the other side of the wall, I've got another level of interior framing over there, which leaves a huge cavity in behind there. So every time there's a critter that makes its way into this house, which is all the time because the foundation isn't sealed up yet, there's a virtual highway running around my building here that we have to maintain all the critters with. It's unbelievable. I've got, I've got a, evidence of animals in there. I've got acorns. I've got remains. <laughs> it's just nuts. So let's just talk about real quick how to think of this space as finished so you can go back to the beginning and then move forward with something that's not going to have you doing things over and over and over again. First of all, we have challenges because all of our exterior walls are not straight. They're all bowed under the weight of the building and all of the floor joists are, are not sitting on anything. They're all just nailed into the side. Okay, so there's lots of sag, there's lots of movement, there's lots of pressure. So I don't have anything plumb in the entire building. So when you're thinking of renovating an old space, you might want to do what I'm doing here, which is one, some aspects of this room, I'm not making any smaller. I'm actually going to laminate a two by fours um, on the side and add a little bit more insulation than a vapor barrier. And I'll follow a little bit of that curve and it's not really a big issue. If it's just drywall and, and that's it, not an issue. But in some areas, like in my bathroom, I've actually reframed the entire wall inside the old wall because my foundation is so thick. I'm trying to bring my insulation level in line with what it is in the crawl space. So that gets me a lot closer. It also allows me to plumb it off. So I have a nice plumb wall. Everything in that bathroom is going to be needing plumb and square. So I'm plumbed in a brand new wall. It allows me to put my plate for that wall right underneath all the floor joist package. So that way I can actually transfer load directly right down to the floor. And again, I can seal it all up and know that I've got it plumb. I've got no air moving. I've got proper level of insulation. And the other thing I get to do is I don't have to remove all the old crap 
full of old dust and mice droppings and everything else. I'm just going to build right across in front of it and forget it even exists. <laughs> it's a bit of a cheat, but since I'm adding enough insulation on a brand new frame wall, I don't have to remove the old stuff in order to put in new stuff. And that made it real quick and simple. Well, here we are in the bathroom. Uh, this is kind of fun because what we have here is a more than standard size bathroom. It's five feet and seven inches. I'm working on my own house here, so I've pulled my own electrical permit and I'm gonna update my wiring from just a plug and a switch to all the modern amenities. So before we get started, let's talk about the legal implications of wiring in your own home. If you do wiring and it doesn't get inspected and it's not on a permit, in a lot of cases, if you run into any kind of issue, your insurance company is gonna run for the hills on you. So, disclaimer, if you own your own home, most jurisdictions let you do your own electrical work in your house. Depending where you live, you might have to call in for a permit. So double check in your jurisdiction before you go ahead and do anything like this, because this stuff, this stuff is dangerous. And if you don't do it right, you could run into a serious problem. Now, in this particular case, I'm working in my own home. I did call the ESA, which in our area is called the Electrical Safety Authority. You put out a few bucks and you get a permit. In a lot of cases, it's based on how many electrical fixtures you're doing. So it's a real simple application process. It's less than $100 in most cases, and it's definitely worth your time and energy to do it if you're comfortable doing this sort of thing. But what I'm going to do is I'm just going to run my feeds, get my rough in passed, and then I'm going to actually hire an electrician to come in and wire to the panel my panel's a little outdated and it's a little outside of my toolbox. Now, knowing how to do your proper electrical rough-in will save you a ton of money. And these staples on the package will tell you what wires that they're rated for. So this is good for a 14.2 and a 14.3 wire, which is what we have, which is lovely. And generally speaking, our building code requires us to have a staple every five feet. And if you don't use staples, you'll see how flimsy this stuff can be. We've seen it all the time. We pull a, wire, a wall off and we've got a compressed wire. Compressed wires are dangerous because they heat up and they can cause a fire. Which is why when you're putting in your staple, you don't bury these little tabs into the wood. And that leaves tons of room for the wire to move around so it's not under any kind of compression. Now, in this particular bathroom, I'm going to be putting a strapping on the ceiling. So I'm going to put one by threes every 16 inches or so. So I have a channel that I can actually run on my electrical right up against my floor joists. And then wrap underneath and come across. Now, in order to bring this wire down, we do have to go through the plate. Drilled my auger bed here. Here's my box, and this is a two gang box. It means I can have two different functions on it. We're gonna have one for our lights, and we're gonna have one for the fan. The other power for the thermostat is going to be in a separate box. We'll put that on in just a minute. These boxes come in two different kinds. This is called a welded box, which means the sides don't disengage. It's a different kind out there. It's called a gangable box, and the sides actually have little screw locks, and you can disengage them, and you can build on and add them longer and longer and screw them back together. Those are really common in a lot of commercial applications, simply because people are always changing their mind about their electrical needs. They have drop ceilings. It's really easy to make adjustments. But in a residential environment, if you buy the welded box, it'll save you some time and energy. Because when you put that on your stud and you screw it in, you're good to go. If this is a gang of box with screws, you then have to go grab some 2x4 and screw that onto the other side of the box according to code. And that has to be attached to the drywall. And that makes sure that this side plate never comes disengaged from that box. It's a lot of extra work, and you're only saving 20 cents. So I say get the welded box, make your life easy. One more quick mention before we get going any further, because you're in a bathroom, we have to watch the golden rule. That is 36. Your electrical switches have to be 36 inches from any contact with water. All right, that's very brutal. So just in case you're wondering, my switch is gonna be exactly 37 inches from the edge of my glass, which is more than enough. The top of my box. Now, you can just push that into the softwood lumber like that mount this thing so it'll never move. So now I've got power to my box and this one feed is going to take care of the lights and the fan. I drill a nice one inch hole so I can run two wires through every one of those holes. So now we're going to run our pot lights but I need a second hole. 
because I don't want to run more than two wires in a hole. Put a bit of a curve into this bad boy. And then it's a lot easier to grab when it gets up there. Pinch, quarter turn, slide off. And what you do is you pinch it on the hole that corresponds to the wire. It's almost kind of way too easy, right? So you hit the 14, because it's 14 wire, and you don't damage the copper. Up through our hole for the lights now. Now what we do is with these, we're actually going to tie them together, a couple of twists, all right? And put them up in the ceiling here so that they don't fall out. Now trust me, when you've drilled your hole, it's really easy to pull this out and then identify these wires and then pull them all down. Well, here we are. We've got our electrical rough-in all completed now. Time to call the city inspector, get him a heads up so he can come by for a quick inspection. Make sure I've done everything that makes him happy and that I can close the walls. And he'll actually sign off on a piece of paper giving me permission to close, which is awesome. In the meantime, I'm going to run my exhaust from my fan and we're going to work on a part of the other aspects of this house and try to get the rest of this thing ready to close as well. Whew, so much to do. Time for me to get back to work. Wow, I know it looks like we got a lot to do, but the reality is this. We've got some insulation to do, a little bit of framing. We've got to cut our hole for our door and install that sucker, a little bit of wiring, and we're basically ready to close up and finish this space. Can't wait to get it done. So here's the problem with this kind of house construction. It's typical balloon construction, which means that underneath here, we've got a stack stone wall, and we have these boards here traveling straight through down onto that stone, and that's this, the point load Okay, that carries all the weight of the house. These floorboards here, it's the subfloor and flooring all in one. <laughs> and what they do is they cut around these and slide it in, kind of like finishing a deck. Now, uh, the outside of the house, they've got these wonderful barn boards. It's solid one inch thick, and they clad the entire home. And these boards actually transfer all the weight and keep the house from sliding left and right. So this is a stability, it's part of the structure. So remember when you're working on these old houses, that stuff is structure. If you're going to remove it, understand what you're doing and how you're going to replace the structural component. But here's what happens. We have a stone wall downstairs underneath the crawl space, which means we don't have a thermal break. So we have cold air and hot air mixing coming up through these gaps, hitting this wood, gets incredibly soft. What happens is mice from outside feel the heat coming out and they start eating and they eat a hole right through. Now that's the vinyl siding I'm touching on the other side. And these holes are all over the place. So what we're doing is before we worry about our thermal break, we need a rodent break. <laughs> so what we have to do is take this blocking, stick it in here and create some nice solid dry wood. First order of business. Let's bust into here. Wow, that is actually a really good view. I'm gonna pull this little piece off here. All right. Okay, kids, here we go. This is nasty. So this whole gap exists right to the outside. Stuffing a little bit of this crap in there isn't gonna work. Because as soon as you stuff it, you compress it. And the insulation only works when it's not compressed. So the way we fill this gap is right here. And then you can just shove this in here and have perfect control. And then you just spray. And you start in nice and deep. And this will seal up old and the new to, together. When in doubt, <laughs> just max it out. So then what we have to do, because these cavities in balloon construction are not the same size as insulation, you're gonna have to cut it and install everything in horizontal, all right? And that's fine. Just a little bit extra work, not a real big deal. If you're wondering what the plan is here, because that's only R13. We're gonna frame inside of this wall and insulate again before we put in our vapor barrier. When you're insulating an old house, there's no such thing as the best way to do it. You've gotta do it well, and you wanna limit the amount of air transfer and heat loss and try to control your moisture, but there's no perfect way to do it because the building techniques themselves are actually flawed. So, it's kind of like, we're gonna do a great job, and somewhere in the next 100 years, someone's gonna to have to come back 
and do a lot of rebuilding. But if you're not in the budget to reframe your whole house, then this is the way to go. They're really easy to tape together with your vapor barrier. So you get a vapor and an air barrier. The back of the box has already got a gasket on it. So when you're gonna use it, it's one of these just, you push your wire through, stick your wire through, and it leaves it nice and sealed behind it. Well, three-way switches are not new in the world, and they're required by code in some situations. But in a lot of cases, if you're renovating your house, you're getting open concept. That's the thing nowadays. So whenever you have an open concept, you're going to reduce the opportunities for light switches and you're going to make it rather awkward to have to go turn the lights on and off unless you run a three-way switch. What you need is to use a 14-3 wire and that is going to have a black and a white and a red. So what I have here is a box. It is a plastic box because it's going on the outside of a house and in our area we use vapor barrier on the inside of our homes and so plastic boxes are really convenient because you can tape your box to the plastic. What we're gonna do is we're gonna run our three-way three wire from that box to the other location. Now in our area, electrical code is required. We wanna have a staple within a few inches of the box and then we need a staple or a hole in a stud every five feet. Give yourself extra because you can't splice it together if it's too short. And this 14-3 wire is generally only used for these three-way switch situations. All right, so the way this works, this is the 14-2 wire here entering into the bottom of the box. And this is our 14-3 leaving our first box, traveling over to our other box. Now bend the wire forward, and then it'll just push out of the way for you. And this wire is going to travel up to the first light location that's in our ceiling. So let's go into the light fixture. There we go. Now here's just a quick recap. You have your set power supply to your first location, which is a two wire. You bring a three wire, which is the black, the white, and the red, from one box to the other side of the room to your other box. And then you take your supply line from that box to your fixtures, okay? Nice and simple. If you wire it that way, when you go to put on your switches, they're three-way switch. Light switches are gonna have little black screws. And on those black screws, you put the black wire and everything will work out really easy for you. And when you call your inspector, he sees you've missed a staple. He may not be very kind about it and just fail it and say, call me when you're done. All right, there we go. That's the three-way switch done. So remember, when you're doing this kind of work, always drill a nice big hole, use your staples, get everything done properly, call for an inspection, okay? Remember, nowadays, most insurance companies, if you have a fire related to work you've done in your own home and you haven't called for an inspection, you will not be covered on your insurance. So do not fool around with this, all right? Welcome to my new front door. <laughs> this is a balloon construction house. Um, we're not exactly sure what we're gonna find beneath the siding because this house, of course, is 130, 40 years old and is layer on layer. So our first job here today is to pull all this siding off and expose back to the original siding of this house, which we hope is still there and hope is still in decent shape. And then uh, we'll see what we have to do to go from there. Yeah, man, let's do this. <laughs> Oh yeah, look at that. Let's go this way. It'll pull it, pull it out of the trap. There you go, all the way across. What you'll see is uh, the way this is installed is it has a locking, locking here on the bottom. So you lock it in, and then you nail the top. So you get the whole two rows there. And then you just reach up with your shovel and. Pop the nails out. Wow, this is some old stuff. Why is that? Ah. There it goes. That is nasty, eh? Okay. This entire house was sided 
with an insulation exterior layer added uh -huh. for our value. Yeah. But the reason the house is cold is because the bottom foot and a half has got zero insulation value at all. Is that right? And it's all exposed. It's all above grade. This house is frozen. Be careful you don't buy a product to solve a problem that isn't going to do the job. Ah, yeah, yeah. This would have cost a fortune. <laughs> I guess that's how you that's how you do it. Somewhere in the middle-ish. <laughs> oh, stepped on a nail. Kidding. I'm kidding. <laughs> that, all of that dust is protein. <laughs> oh! Watch your face. No, you watch my face. <laughs> the locking system on the vinyl works pretty good, so we're just using a couple of shovels to pull this off. Oh, this is where it gets exciting. Not too aggressive at the bottom here. Oh yeah, here, look at this. See how that's rotting away? Yeah. It's not even at the bottom yet. This is the effect of snow load and the moisture bringing up. Here we go. Oh. Yeah. And they got in behind there. They couldn't get any further. They made a tunnel going down. There's a hole. Ah, it'll be fun to get there. This came in four by eight panels and they didn't do a seam tape. Mm. So even with the complete exterior wrap, if they just taped the, taped the edges, they would have got rid of all that air, light, all air leak. I'm expecting to find Gold. places where the mice have been able to travel freely in behind the vinyl. And then they're gonna be hunting around looking for heat loss chasing out places where wherever there's heat loss, you have condensation. We have condensation, you have rotting wood. Now, none of these mice ever went to school to learn that, but instinctively they know. If they follow the heat, they'll find a way into the building. Oh. I got a nice hole right here. Yeah, I know, I had to block that one from the inside. <laughs> <laughs> oh, nasty. Get the other part from the other side. You know? Hey! So let's let's reveal the original part of the house here. This Again, cool. don't don't go cutting up. Okay. Oh ho ho! ho. This is exciting. Look at the hole over there. That's awesome. Ready for this? There's your rigid foam. A rabbit could walk in there. <laughs> you can see here, we're at, uh, we're almost April. And even in our climate, I mean, the grass is showing, but there's still ice next to the building. So our ice in the wintertime usually gets up to about here. So what you're looking at is, for the first hundred years of this house, this original exterior cladding was covered in snow and ice. And that is the stack stone mortar joint. Obviously it failed. Somebody came along and repaired it, dug a hole, put in this exterior foam, but that didn't stop the mice because they, they saw the hole here going into the inside of the house, All right? Now we've, we've, since then, we've closed up the hole from the other side, spray foamed, <laughs> all that good stuff, but if we don't get around the exterior of the house and close up all the holes like this, sooner or later they're just gonna eat their way back in. We're gonna contract out to a mill and we'll get some, uh, last three rows have to be replaced. So we'll contract out to a local mill. We'll save a couple of the boards for the profile. And we'll have a few new lengths ripped down and we can reinstall the wood. Brilliant. The rest of the wall is in this kind of condition. We can just sand and fill and paint it. <laughs> So as you can see, there originally was a door here, unbeknownst to us. So that changes our approach a little bit. So originally, I think our door is gonna go somewhere around here. And our plan um, was to remove these boards 
where our door was going so that we can install our door with our brick mold flush up against the board. Uh, so we're going to continue with that. I'm just going to drill my four corners from the inside and then I'll outline it and then we're going to throw on our laser line and we'll remove all the panels here. I think we'll leave the rest of this board on today just for good measure, but we're definitely going to end up removing all of it and putting new siding. Now we have a door. I don't think there's any wood on there that we can save, eh? That we want to save? No, we're not going to try to re-salvage any of this. What is this? Weigh about 150 pounds? Jeez Louise. Let's go, uh, yeah, that's where that works. One, two, three. Flip it. This is just magic stuff, right? If you haven't seen this before, I'd be surprised. What I'm doing is I'm gonna create an area of blue skin inside the building. Now we've got a membrane. And you're gonna see what I'm doing is I'm creating an environment here where the water gets in. It's gonna run down. It's gonna hit this plate. And instead of coming into the building, because the house is sloped and it's sloped in, it's gonna come into this area here and then be directed out. So the other thing you wanna do is you wanna seal up the side of your house. Well, this stuff actually stretches around pretty good. So now the house is sealed up. Yay. When we put the door in, we're going to use these cedar shims. Put every six inches. That'll give it some strength. We'll foam that gap. We're good to go. So I'm a little spoiled rotten here today because I got my helper doing all the heavy lifting. But if you don't have somebody to help you, I'm going to show you a little secret. What we do is we attach a two by four near the top of the door across the framing opening. Remember, the jam size on your door is not thicker than your whole wall package. So you can actually set it in place and then we can put another two by four across in front. That allows you to manipulate the door and get it level and square and shimmed and everything just the way you want it. And then you can remove, once you've got it screwed in, then you can remove all this extra framing. Brilliant. And the lever. So really all you have to do here is set up your level. Let's have a look. Yeah, that looks pretty good. This is the benefit of having a laser. You can use a level to create plumb as much as you like, but when you're installing a door and you have a laser, you are guaranteed perfect result every single time. You wanna get these things in here about every four inches. So that when anybody steps on this, there's a direct load transfer from this plate into the shim to the wood. And that will keep everything from breaking apart and opening up gaps over time that will cause nasty drafts. Doors trimmed. Crazy. That's awesome. Okay, so last part is the foaming. And of course, I love my gun. This is the kind of thing that every homeowner DIYer should use. And the trigger on this gun gives you an incredible amount of control. This gets rid of the air gap in the draft. So the only thing left to do with this door is to install all the hardware and line up that hole there. Good. Safety note, when drilling through metal, always wear safety glasses, even if you can't see what you're doing. Hey. 
Ha. Boom, ready to drill. Woo! Smoky! Okay, latch plate facing the door so that it closes and it will shut. The deadbolt, we drilled our own hole. And we want to hammer it with something. Boom, 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 with something. Hey, that's what tape measures are for. <laughs> Perfect. Okay. Screw to install. Always back it up and burn it in before you drive it through. That'll keep it from splitting. Very nice. Ooh. Let's double check one more time. Nice. Very nice. Okay. One, two, three, four, five, six. Waiting for a green light. And there it is. <laughs> we got it. All right. <laughs> and that is that. So there we go. Simple. That was about as simple as it gets. Finally something that worked the first time. <laughs> Okay, well, sweet. Now that the door is installed, it's just a matter of waiting for electrical inspection. Next time we come back, this room's gonna be finished. Wow, is it gonna be amazing. Here we are, got a finished space, finally. Listen guys, for everybody who quickly went to the end of this video to see what this looks like, here it is, front entrance. This house has never looked so good. Um, we're just gonna go real quick through a couple of the details because if you're planning a project like this at home, knowing the end from the beginning is key. So first of all, we have a lot of pot lights in the ceiling. We always put our pot lights on dimmer control, different time of the day, different lighting requirement. Helps to set the right mood. We also have really high baseboards. Let's take a look at this over here. We've got a five and a half inch baseboard. This is solid wood. This is not MDF, okay? It expands and contracts much better than MDF, which only tends to expand. It never tends to really contract properly. It also comes with a great shoe mold, which covers all the details in this 140 year old floor. Now for the stairs, we decided to go with a carpet with a solid white kickback. You'll notice no riser on the outside. It's a very ultra modern look, and I think it really complements the home. Looks amazing going up to the loft, which will be in another video. But we do have a luxury vinyl plank flooring, and of course, all the build outs and window trims. Nice and simple, right? Listen, if you love this kind of information, I know it's been a lot of information in this video. We covered almost every aspect of renovation on an old house, so you can make it look brand new. Subscribe, click the like button, bell for notifications okay this journey is going to be amazing this is the first step on our 1880s farmhouse we're going to be covering every aspect of the home inside and out even the roof so don't miss the ride click over here to subscribe and join our channel okay and then you can click over here and take a look at the playlist we've got awesome content with all kinds of different renovations to help you get inspired for your next renovation